The Tom Woods Show, episode 1559. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Get ready for Contra Cruise 2020. This is the fifth cruise economist Bob Murphy and I have hosted together, and it is always a blast. And this year will be no different. Scott Horton and Dave Smith are joining us as special guests. Can you imagine spending a week having a blast with these guys on board a beautiful ship with a bunch of like-minded folks? It's going to be fantastic. Check it out at ContraCruise.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Just a quick reminder, as we approach the end of 2019 and with Christmas coming, the number of episodes will be diminishing per week temporarily, which is better than I normally do. In the past, I've skipped out on a couple of weeks just to take a little vacation, but I will sprinkle a few episodes throughout this interim period until after the first of the year when we'll resume our normal Monday through Friday schedule. Just want to let you know so you're not thinking anything has happened to me. I'm just taking a little time off, as I do always, but a little bit less this year for the sake of you good folks who crave your Tom Woods Show episodes. Well, today I've got Lou Rockwell with me again. We're going to be talking about the most recent Democratic debate, this one here in December 2019 at Loyola Marymount University. Lou, as virtually all of you know, is, of course, the publisher of LouRockwell.com, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. He's also the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute and formerly chief of staff to Ron Paul, Ron Paul's first chief of staff in Congress. So we've made a tradition of going through these debates and talking about them, and today is no different. Lou, welcome back. Tom, it's great to be with you, although probably not great to be watched that last night. Oh, geez. You know, and I, people I talk to say they didn't even know there was a debate last night. I mean, nobody... <laughs> I think we were the only people watching, in fact. I know, I know, honestly. And especially with the, you know, the impeachment stuff that's been taking up all the news, I think people just didn't hear about it. Not that they would have rushed to watch if they had, but I I, I just... It's, it's like the Afghanistan papers. You know, it's... You, you, might think there'd be some curiosity about it, but but there's just been no coverage. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. So, uh, all right, let, let's at least do a little bit of an episode here with our impressions. I I copied and pasted a few passages. I got the transcript this morning from the Washington Post, and uh, we'll talk about those. But does anything change for you in watching this debate in terms of relative strengths? Well, I thought Biden had his best debate. He didn't stumble. He didn't, he, he seemed to be much more in, in control of himself. And um, on the other hand, they didn't call on him. At least for the first part of the debate, he was barely there. So well, I guess that was intentional. And they had uh, Amy Klobuchar, was, I guess, the person who got the, mo- the most time. And um, I must say, I don't, I don't find her very interesting. But then Elizabeth Warren and the Drudge Bull came in last and I think that's probably correct. I mean, she's just, the more you see of her, the more, it seems to me the more she's just like a uh, the, the school marm shaking her finger at you all evening. And um, just, uh, she, she went after Mayor Pete because he'd held a fundraiser in a wine cave. I'm not sure what a wine cave is, but it sounds interesting. Yeah. Uh, so he said- I, I would probably like to go to one, <laughs> not even knowing what it is. I, sounds good. So, yeah. He said that, um, you know, you're always talking about millionaires and billionaires and how terrible they are. You're a millionaire. And he said, I'm the only person on this stage who's not a millionaire. So among Democrats, I guess that uh, saying that you don't have any money is a good thing. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So it's it's, uh, Yang, Andrew Yang came in first on the drudge poll by a, a massive margin. And, uh, you know, I think, he, I think he did well. I mean, a lot of the stuff he says is terrible, but he always says it in an interesting and smart way. You know, as you pointed out before, the rest of these people just seem like they're repeating talking points. He always seems like he's thinking and talking at the same time, which the rest yeah. of them maybe can't do. Yeah. So that, uh, you know, he, he's interesting, but the whole, the, he was interesting in the context of this debate, but I don't believe anybody was, I frankly don't think anybody watched it. I mean, I'll be interested to see what the, the figures show, but I, I think that uh, this was, was not a watched event. And even though, uh, you know, Bernie again, Bernie's always Bernie. I mean, he's shouting and waving his arms and, 
And he didn't mean, he didn't go so far as to mention a forbidden word, Palestinians. He said that he thought that uh, uh, the Palestinians had gotten a raw deal and that he was a proud Jew, but uh, nevertheless, he, he thought that something should be done for the Palestinians. So that was interesting. And, um, but these, that when I say interesting, I mean interesting in the context of an extremely boring oh, yeah. two and a half hours. I mean, it was just, and, and the, I thought the, uh, the moderators were terrible. The whole thing was terrible. Now, the point you make about Yang, which we've noted a number of times, it just can't be denied. And I want to give an example of, of that in just a minute. But for some reason, there are people who, if I say something like, I think Tulsi Gabbard, who was not in last night's debate, yes, very so. uh, you know, makes some good points or is an interesting candidate. I get people saying that I've endorsed Tulsi Gabbard or <laughs> don't I know she's not a libertarian. And it's like these people are what Michael Malice call midwits. Like they're not extremely stupid, but they're not bright and they don't know that they're not bright. So they're midwits. So I know Tulsi Gabbard's not a libertarian, but I can still say I think she made a good point or I'm glad she's there. Or whatever. Yeah. Well, likewise, I'm not endorsing Andrew Yang. And I think most of what he says is terrible. But I am capable, however, of saying that I think uh, he is a thinker and I think he is trying to tease out real responses rather than just repeat talking points. And unfortunately, in this day and age, it's very hard, even among libertarians, to get people who are willing to say, you know, I disagree with so-and-so about these issues, but I like what he has to say about blah, blah, blah. If only they could say things like that about Woods. That's all I'm asking. You don't have to like everything about me, but you could say he's half decent on some things. I can't seem to get that. But anyway, but Yang, here's here's what they were asking originally uh, early on. Why can't you seem to get more Americans on board with the impeachment? And they could not give an, they would not even try to answer that question. They were explaining why we needed the impeachment. That's not the question. Why have you failed to bring more people on board? So eventually when it became clear that nobody was going to answer that question, then the moderators who are obviously in the tank for the Democrats changed the question to, well, what additional arguments could you offer in favor of the impeachment? Which is not what they were originally asking. They began to ask the question that the candidates had obviously decided to answer. So they just sort of switched the question. But Yang really did answer the question. And he gave the most sensible remark I thought of the whole night. And so here's what he said. It's clear why Americans can't agree on impeachment. We're getting news from different sources, and it's making it hard for us even to agree on basic facts. Congressional approval rating, last I checked, was something like 17%, and Americans don't trust the media networks to tell them the truth. The media networks didn't do us any favors by missing a reason why Donald Trump became our president in the first place. If you turn on cable network news today, you would think he's our president because of some combination of Russia, racism, <laughs> Facebook, Hillary Clinton, and emails all mixed together. But Americans all around the country know different. We blasted away 4 million manufacturing jobs that were primarily based in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri. I just left Iowa. We blasted 40,000 manufacturing jobs there. The more we act like Donald Trump is the cause of all our problems, the more Americans lose trust that we can actually see what's going on in our communities and solve these problems. What we have to do is stop being obsessed over impeachment, which unfortunately strikes many Americans like a ball game where you know what the score is going to be. <laughs> Yeah. And it actually start digging in and solving the problems that got Donald Trump elected in the first place. We have to take every opportunity to present a new positive vision for the country, a new way forward to help beat him in 2020, because make no mistake, he'll be there at the ballot box for us to defeat. Wow. Not bad. Well, he also, he speaks in sentences and paragraphs. He does. And, I was yeah. able to read that and it <laughs> sounded like an essay. Yeah, he's, he's uh, very smart. So, so we have he has that going for him. And he, as, as I say, he, I think he got forty four percent of the, on the Drudge poll as number one, and uh, Elizabeth Warren got four percent, or actually less than four percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that does tell you something, but it, it, in a way, it does, you know, in the same way with Tulsi Gabbard, remind you a little bit about the Ron Paul years. They had a lot of enthusiasm, but the people who decide these things are old people who don't know how to vote in online polls, but who show up at those polling places if it's the, they are going to vote for more mm -hmm. war and more slavery if it's the last thing they do, these people. They're the ones who vote. I mean, Lou, present company accepted. 
Okay, but, <laughs> but I'm afraid I that don't demographic. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so let's get back into this. I've, I've got a few uh, little specifics. So first thing, though, in looking at some of these is to remind uh, us about uh, one particular feature of Elizabeth Warren, which is that you just can't, you can't get an answer out of her half the time. So, for example, she was asked a simple question. You proposed free public college tuition and student loan forgiveness for most families. Why should wealthy families be able to send their kids to public college for free? Why not concentrate that government help on those most in need? And then she proceeded to give a speech about why she wanted to have her program. She never answered that question. She talked about, you know, we need education. Education is just so important. (laughs) We really need to invest in it. But the question is not, is education important or not? Because who would ask that question? Uh, you think there's a Democrat who says, nah, I think it's overrated. So no one would ask that. They were asking specifically about this thing. No answer. And I th- I bet if we went back and looked, I bet she probably didn't really answer half the questions she was asked. I'm, I'm sure that's true. I mean, she doesn't, uh, she's got a program she wants to discuss always. Yeah. She's got 75 different programs. And it's it's interesting to me that still no Democrat has attacked her on her phony Indian business, nor have they attacked her on, on uh, uh, there was a law professor from Cornell who was on Tucker Carlson the other night who said there are 50 examples of her making large amounts of money representing big corporations against their employees, uh, including ones who were uh, sick from uh, job-related illnesses. And, you know, I, I, I'm not against her doing that, but uh, it seems to me that would be deadly if somebody were to mention that. But, of course, nobody does mention it. But, of course, it will be mentioned in the campaign if she were to be the nominee. I don't think she has a chance to be the nominee. But were she to be the nominee, she'd be dead because of the things. And also, of course, she's a liar. I mean, she lies about almost everything. And when she's not lying, as you say, as you say she's not answering the question. So she's, I think, a very unpleasant person. And uh, probably her best moment last night, although I didn't like it, was when uh, they were asking both, uh, she asked her, uh, Biden, Bernie, and Elizabeth Warren, saying, in effect, hey, you're so old, why should you be the nominee? And she said, uh, well, if I were the nominee, I'd be the oldest woman nominee. No, should, should I be the youngest woman nominee? Excuse me, the youngest woman nominee, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody uh, laughed and applauded and so forth. But she never answered the question. Yeah, no, it's it's because the, it's... The thing is, she's not a dumb person. She's she's a very intelligent no, no, person. No, she's not. No. So she is capable of speaking and 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 formulating ideas. But they've all just been trained to be robots and repeat the speeches that we had you memorize in the debate prep. And how how often do we have to hear about the hundred thousand selfies that she's taken? Oh, for heaven's and sake! And all the yeah. uh, stories that people have told her. Now we're we supposed to think that people are actually getting time to tell her a, a significant story about their their troubles when she's got these vast numbers of people allegedly lining up for selfies. I mean, right, it's of course. How, how would that be possible? No, it's, right. it's, it's yeah, another and, lie. And then Joe Biden is talking about people say, Joe, I just lost my job. <laughs> Can you help me? Joe, I need to get this medicine. Can you help me? I, yeah. I mean, th- so there's something. So he has something. between 50 and 100 phone calls. He calls people once a week or maybe once a month or, you know, and uh, listens to their problems and then hangs up. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, apparently that's what's going on. <laughs> and I just say to them, well... Uh, like what is he? What is he telling them? And, and there's something deeply pathetic about that. That that you would think. Well, let's see. Some something has happened to me. Let me go ask a federal employee what they can do for me. I mean, the, f- first of all, what I hate to be old fashioned about this, but there was the originally the idea that the federal government was not supposed to really be where you would look to for the solution to your problem. You weren't really supposed to look to any level of government. But the last level you would look to is the federal government in Washington, D.C. Yes. Because of your broken leg or whatever it is. I mean, what? it would be nice if somebody would say, that's really, that's screwed up. We got our our priorities all wrong and, and we've got the pecking order all wrong. You know, you do have families and neighbors and local institutions that presumably can help you without sitting there waiting for the U.S. Senate to help you with this. I mean, it's like people become helpless or something. Um, Klobuchar had a, had a recipe for solving our problems, which is to let the entire world come into this country. She said that our economy wouldn't succeed if we didn't bring in everybody who wanted to come. And uh, I don't know, is that half a million? Is that half a billion? I mean, I don't know. But she said that we want to have a more perfect union, and uh, that's why we should bring everybody in. 
And I think it was Steve Saylor this morning who said, you know, the rest of that line has to do with because of uh, for our posterity's sake, which she said you can't say that, of course, because it's racist. Uh, but again, she she was the I think the the rest of them were, of course, pro immigration, but nobody actually talked about health care for all illegals and that sort of thing anymore. But she was saying, bring everybody in. I'm quite certain that the feedback they got was not good on uh, where this is going to be another. But basically, we're going to increase one of the protected classes and we're going to increase the amount of money that needs to be spent on all these public services. That's probably not going over well, but that is obviously a, a major part of all that. Yes. Uh, I, I want to ask a somewhat unrelated question, but because we've in every one of these debate episodes has had something to say about Tulsi Gabbard. We should make note of why we're not mentioning her. I assume most people will know that she declared in advance that even if she qualified for the debate, she was going to sit it out. Now, I actually don't know if she, in fact, by whatever metrics they're using these days, if she did qualify. No, she, know, she did look, not. She did not. But no. but even if she had, she said she was going to sit the debate out. Now, do you know why, what her thinking behind that well, was? Well, this is just a guess, and it's maybe not a very flattering one, but I, I think that she, because she thought that she was not going to vote for impeachment, she'd be the target of the whole debate. Oh, that's a good point. And so that uh, is maybe why she she said that she, regardless of whether she qualified or not, she was going to be in New Hampshire and Iowa campaigning. Well, that's that's you know not a that's not a believable excuse. But my guess is because, again because she she voted present, which I think is an unfortunate vote. I mean, it seems to me you should either vote yes or no. But because they all would they all would have wanted to kill her, including the moderators, of course. Right, right, right. And I mean, I wonder what's going through her mind right now, That what she's been through, because she's had people accusing her uh, preposterously of being a Russian asset. What, because <laughs> she doesn't toe the U.S. regime's line on everything? Yeah. And and then, of course, if she doesn't uh, get rid of Trump, or she doesn't vote to, I beg your pardon, vote to impeach Trump, then, of course, that would be further evidence, because we all know that Trump is pushing the Russian line, even though the Trump administration policy toward Russia has been quite bellicose. It's hor it's, horrendous, horrendous. Yeah, so the idea that it, the whole thing is just a derangement. It's Now, I, I get that the deep state, they all know this is a lie I mean, because they're just, you know, they're just pulling a con on the public. But the average person who has the Trump derangement syndrome really does believe this stuff. I mean, as I say, the people who are pushing it obviously don't because they have IQs higher than 50. But you do run into people who, honest to goodness, seem to believe this. So Tulsi, therefore, I, I mean, what she must be confronting in terms of low IQ, knuckle-dragging uh, responses to her positions must be impossible to navigate by now. Must be very tough. On the other hand, Ron Paul did it, and and uh, my guess is that, you know, she's going to keep, she's not changing her position on war, so that, and then, in fact, I thought it was interesting last night that Bernie actually said that the U.S. has to immediately get out of Afghanistan. And so, he admitted that he was wrong to have voted for that war, yes. which is something. I mean, yes. it's easy to say you were wrong to vote for the Iraq war because that's the fashionable thing to say nowadays. But to say Barbara Lee, who cast the lone no vote, mm -hmm. she was, uh, was the one who was right. Well, I mean, I think that does take some, you know, I mean, it does take some guts to say that. Even Buttigieg said that uh, uh, we have to end the forever wars. I don't think he means it, although maybe, who, who knows? Who knows? Uh, maybe Bernie doesn't mean it either, but at least he said it. Yes, yes, yes. I had not thought of that obvious, now that you say it to me, of course that's why she chose to, to sit it out, because of what was obviously going to happen to her. I liked, by the way, I liked that Yang formulation that most Americans look at the impeachment as a baseball game where the score is already determined. <laughs> Very funny. No, <laughs> exactly correct. That is exactly, of course that's what it is. It's, it's, it's just crazy. Um, now, also, this the wealth tax thing that Elizabeth Warren is, is pushing, it, you know, every time I hear her say two cent, a two cent tax, I think of it's you. A line creep, yeah. Right, from a previous episode, because of course it's not, if it were two cents, right, <laughs> nobody would, I mean, even I probably wouldn't care, <laughs> right? But it's not two cents, it's two per cent, <laughs> which is a pretty big deal. As a start. Yes, as a start. And of course, obviously what this does is uh, inhibits capital formation, which as Mises explained, is literally the only way to improve the standard of living of of 
all the people. There is no, logically, there is no other way to do it. And yet she had the nerve to say in a, the midst of a speech about her wealth tax, we can increase productivity in this country. But <laughs> yes, we can, but by not yeah. doing what you want to do, because productivity increases come through capital accumulation, which occurs when, when the money to fund it is not taxed away. That's right. But there's nobody really, this, uh, I mean, I, I will say that Buttigieg, I mean, again, at least when you hear a fleeting bit of common sense on one of these, you have to appreciate it. He did say we have to be reasonable and we should listen when there are tax proposals put forward that most economists tell us will be a drag mm -hmm. on the economy. So there was some acknowledgement by somebody that was, they were asked, Elizabeth Warren, well, don't you think you should listen to these economists who say that these taxes you're proposing be bad for the economy? She said, oh, they're wrong. <laughs> oh, oh, are they? Yeah, so, yeah. so you just seize wealth from people and devote it to economically arbitrary projects, and this is a net plus for you somehow. Yeah. So, so, so there's that. So, I didn't actually. I, by the time they get to the closing statements, I was, I'd kind of drifted off. I'll be honest with you. So, I don't know if anybody said anything noteworthy. Those must be the most canned parts of all. Oh yeah, no. Uh, so I don't know if there was anything there that no, I missed. You missed nothing. <laughs> strongly suspected as much. <laughs> oh, gosh. So I don't even know. I mean, I think, I. do you have anything left over you want to say? Is there another one of these next year? Yeah, <laughs> this probably is. <laughs> I, I feel like on these days, we should do something else until it becomes time for the Democrat to debate Trump. And then it becomes kind of interesting again. Maybe no, you I, and I will do some kind of like uh, walk down memory lane and talk about some something important in the history of libertarianism or something. Just anything other than making people endure this. Oh, it would be fun. And by the way, I thought it, I think it's very interesting and correct that Trump is saying that he's not going to go along with the presidential commission on debates because he won't trust who they pick for the moderators, which, of course— is exactly right. I mean, my own view is they ought to bring back the League of Women Voters. I remember to, that in the 80s. These. No, and you could trust them. So they were very, they tried to be objective. And, and uh, but this presidential commission, of course, is very, uh, would be very anti-Trump. And he's already said that he's, you know, he thinks he's not going to do it. So there'll have to be another, another organization running it. And, um, and I suppose that means if, if it's not another organization, then he won't participate in the debates and it'll just be, Hillary or uh, whomever doing their single performance. I just want to mention, not connected to anything really, but I was talking to David Stockman recently on this show. And then before that, I found out about this actually in person with him. I had not realized that Stockman helped to train Reagan for the 1980 right. and 1984 debates. He stood in as John Anderson, the independent candidate. Then he stood in as both Carter and Mondale. And so he would give the strongest arguments that those people might make. And I and I just, I can't believe I know this guy so well, you know, that, <laughs> and, and that I could talk to him about this. And I asked him, so how, did Reagan get better? Did he start, he said, yeah, early on, we would do these mock debates and I would make a point and Reagan would say, all right, what's the answer? <laughs> and so we would give him the answer. But by the end of the week, he knew everything. Like he had it absolutely down. But then there was a bit of a scandal because apparently somebody, unknown to this day who, managed to get their hands on a copy of the prep papers for the debate that the Carter campaign had. I think it was, I can't remember if it was Carter or Mondo. I think it was Carter. And it was like 800 pages. <laughs> and it was delivered anonymously to Stockman's doorstep. So I said, well, I mean, is there an ethical problem <laughs> related to this? They said, well, look, somebody gave it to me. Well, so I looked at it. But but the, the interesting thing about that is I highly doubt anybody today, any of these candidates has an 800-page prep book. No. They have five canned speeches, and that's the end of it. No, and Carter is a smart guy. Yeah. Whatever else yeah. you may think about him. Sure, sure. Okay, well, listen, everybody, check out lourockwell.com uh, regularly the way I do, and you'll get some great uh, content. And then not only the Lou Rockwell blog, but you got to click, go to the menu at lourockwell.com and find the political theater blog. Man, do I live for that thing. And uh, I just, I love reading the stuff Lou manages to find. It's always interesting and, and worthwhile. So go do that. I'll link to these things at tomwoods.com slash 1559. And Lou, thanks again. Tom, thank you. Okay, folks, I realize you are probably rushing around like crazy, 
given the time of year, but put in the back of your mind that come January, when you're thinking about what are you going to do for the second half of the school year with your homeschooler, give the Ron Paul curriculum a try. It's self-taught. It's got quite a few courses that are going to give your student a major leg up. And most importantly, you can keep your mental health because it's self-taught and you don't have to run yourself ragged. But in particular, when you join, make sure you join through my link because you get a bunch of bonuses. I'll give you a subscription to Liberty Classroom. So that supplements the courses. I'll give you a personalized autographed copy of the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, plus a special course on the Foundations of Liberty aimed at middle schoolers that I created just for people who use my link. And my link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. All right, see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.